Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and friends, it is my great pleasure as a CEO of the Glencree Centre for Peace and Reconciliation to welcome you all here tonight for this, our fourth Uno Higgins O'Malley annual lecture. Our annual lecture is a very special night for us each year, a night on which we honour the spirit, tenacity and enormous contribution that UNA made in founding the Glencree Centre and working tirelessly over many years to create and hold a safe space for people to come and talk to one another and to work through difficult issues, building long-lasting relationships across divides. UNA's spirit continues to serve as inspiration to us all in Glencree. We are very mindful of her important legacy and of our responsibility to keep working for peace on this island and beyond, offering a safe space to those who wish to engage with the other and work towards peaceful resolutions to conflict. We are particularly, we are particularly delighted to welcome members of UNA's family here tonight to join with us in honouring her memory. We welcome Art and Isild. After two very difficult years of COVID, it is our great pleasure to be able to host an in-person event once more. It's been a difficult time for us all, and I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the Glencree team, who throughout these past two years have adapted our programs and events to ensure that the work endured and that those we work with continue to be supported in their journey towards reconciliation. The resilience, commitment, and public service ethic of our staff is a source of great pride for me in Glencree, and it is my greatest professional honor to work with you all. I also want to thank our funders, whose continued confidence in us allowed us to navigate the difficult waters of the pandemic with minimal disruption to our work and the services we provide. I particularly wish to thank the Swiss Embassy and the Department of Foreign Affairs, who have not only supported this event tonight, but have continued to believe in us and our work and work with us uh, throughout the last number of years, investing in Glencree's ongoing development. It is also my pleasure to note that Glencree has recently been selected as a strategic partner of the Department of Foreign Affairs Reconciliation Fund, and we are deeply grateful for the, increasing, sorry, for the department's steadfast support, which has made all the difference to our increasing stability and growth in recent years. Despite the challenges of the pandemic, it also created an opportunity for quiet reflection for many of us, which is something we don't always have the time for in Glencree while struggling an intense schedule of travel, programme events and in-person dialogues. During this quieter period, Glencree undertook a comprehensive strategic review process, and with the support of the Swiss Embassy here in Ireland, we have developed a new five-year strategic plan which seeks to strengthen our organisation and protect the work of Glencree into the future. The renewed focus provided by this strategy and our new plans for Glencree's development are something we are excited to share with you tonight as we formally launch our strategic plan 2022-2026. I would now like to welcome our Chair of the Board, Barbara Walsh, who will tell you more about the future that we imagine for Glencree. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm really excited about the fact there are humans in the room and that we have an opportunity to be able to engage with each other and to meet each other kind of person to person. It's something. That has been missing for the last couple of years, so it's good that we're here. So, as we celebrate the legacy of Uno Higgins O'Malley, we look forward to this evening's lecture and discussion. Named appropriately, Changing Times, Fixed Geography, Ireland and Great Britain. But first of all, I want to talk to you about our plans for Glencree as it charts its way forward over the next five years. For those of you that don't know, and Neve alluded to there, Glen Cree has been at the centre of peace building here on the island of Ireland for almost 50 years. We're currently preparing for the 50th anniversary um, of, of Glen Cree's existence and its, and its work. In 1974, a group of very committed people came together from all faiths and none that were disturbed deeply about the violence in Northern Ireland and wanted to wanted to respond in whatever way they could um, that would be helpful at that particular time. Throughout her life, Uno Higgins O'Malley and many with her really devoted, as she did, devote her life to that. Her own experience of the loss of her father, Kevin O'Higgins, in 1927, who was shot by anti-treaty forces in a, as a, in a bitter civil war, left her with the whole notion that really this island needed to be, to, to reconcile with each other. We need to forgive each other for what has been done <clears throat> by ourselves and to others, and we need to learn to live together. So a core tenet of that work in some way has informed Glencree's life, and it's something that really informs, then will continue to inform our direction today. She 
And subsequently, Glencree learned that quiet, confidential spaces were crucial to help people meet, develop relationships, build trust, to listen to op opposing opinions. And even when people didn't agree with each other, at least they could hear each other and hear each other respectfully. And today, I suppose, a core tenet of, of the work is really based on those principles again. And as we launch the strategic plan this evening here in Dublin Castle, and this is our third attempt to try and do it, last November in March and so, and, and this evening, you know, a plan is just a means as a, as a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. You know, so the implementation of what it is that's in that document that you probably have at the moment is really what will will drive Glencree forward for the next five years. And we're really lucky to have a CEO like Neve who will be charged with the implementation and the driving of that forward. Um, the plan itself, crafted at a time and influenced by the consequences of the decision by our nearest neighbour to leave the European Union, a country we are culturally, socially and economically closely connected to it. I'd say if I was to ask any of you here, you will have either worked in the UK or your children will work in the UK or your grandchildren will work in the UK. So the common travel area and us coming and going as we have done, you know, since the foundation of the state and before is just a core part of the relationship that exists within this island. And it's a bit fractured at the moment and a bit contentious, but at some level, you know, we have to work through it. Throughout 2021, despite the pandemic, we asked key questions of our stakeholders, of ourselves, and of other relevant outsiders and insiders. Were we still relevant? Was there a role for us? Um, as a peace centre here on this island? And who were we now as distinct as to who we were? We commissioned research from the Centre for Conflict Development and Peacebuilding in Geneva to look at the external environment in a Europe and a world which was becoming polarised politically, where multilateralism was being undermined and democracy was being eroded. They're like all big questions, and for us, where could we contribute best within all of that? We did further research and looked at the Ireland and in the UK, and looked to see where the potential collaborations could be there between us, so that we could in some way magnify the contribution that we could make. As part, we also had 30 interviews conducted really for our, 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 our future direction. And it was kind of gratifying to hear after all that, that our reputation remains characterized by nonpartisanship, independence and confidentiality after almost five decades of working for peace. And I suppose we recognize that the future of peace matters not just in Ireland and not just to Ireland, but in places where there is no peace, no hope of peace. We stand for the possibility that there can be peace anywhere when we act on what really matters to us. So our approach today is characterized by informal diplomacy, facilitating dialogue with groups and individuals, supporting developing networks and relationships, sharing what we have learned, building capacity, providing education in an increasingly polarized and noisy environment, and we promote public discourse and the importance of democracy. So when you look at those five objectives that we have there, they're very simply, they're very simply known. In a sense, there is a strong practical commitment to peace on this island, to peace between these islands, a strong commitment to intercultural peace and understanding on this island, and a strong commitment to the, to the creation of a center of excellence in practical peace building on the Glencree campus and virtually and the first workshop we held uh, just recently on starting down that road. A strong commitment to collaboration with agencies and organizations and partners. And as Neve mentioned, we are very proud to be a partner with the Department of Foreign Affairs 
uh, foreign affairs and trade, and with our other partners who support us, the Community Foundation um, of Ireland, the Tomar Trust, the Mount Street Trust, the Oblate Community, and our members and our friends. And as well as bringing funding, which of course is important and really important, but they also bring their support and expertise and their eyes in a different world, really, that adds to our world. So tonight, as well, no, so the other thing is we really want to develop Glentree's heritage on the site itself as a campus and as a resource and to make the place more financially sustainable. I say that because this is my seventh year here as chair of the board at Glencree, and finance is always an issue, and, and one of our core tenants has been in those seven years is really to make, to make the center more financially sustainable than it is. So over the next five years, that's the road we will go down along with the support of of the partners, the program partners, and the projects that we have ourselves. So tonight's a night for gratitude, right, to say thanks. Thanks to the people that help. To Adam Grennan, who isn't with us this evening, he's in Portugal taking the sun, who project managed the, the strategic plan and the mechanisms of that over 18, 18 months and was really an invaluable support to us during that particular time. I'd also like to pay tribute to the Swiss Embassy in Ireland and the former ambassador, José Louis Toro, who funded the background research in the first place on the current status of peace building in Europe. Social researching Brian Harvey, who did further research. The board subgroup, who led the process, Sean McGarty, Denise Collins, Robin Hannan, Neve Darcy, myself, Joan O'Flynn, who was interim uh, CEO at the time while Neva was on maternity leave, and Neve now, who is driving the process towards its implementation. Again, thanks to the Department of Foreign Affairs for their consistent support. It has been a massive support to us. So what matters to us now is doing what we said we would do, maintaining our public service ethic. So as we've always said, how can we be useful? to peace on this island and, 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 and anywhere else that's in trouble and in conflict. And uh, I quoted a really profound source, Muhammad Ali, who said that service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. So we're paying the rent. So subsequently and finally, we want to thank you for your support as leaders, funders, thinkers, helpers. We need you all. Thanks very much. Thank you, Barbara. I think I speak on behalf of uh, the staff and I hope that the broader team in Glencree that we're all quite excited about what the next five years bring for, for Glencree. Um, before we introduce the lecture, I'd like to note that today is the anniversary of the Dublin Monaghan, Monaghan bombings, which took place 48 years ago and claimed the lives of 33 people. We would like to acknowledge these events and as testimony to a period when the argument for force overcame the force of argument in political discussion, a time that none of us wish to return to. We remember those who lost their lives for victims' families to have a victim forgotten by society in an act of political violence is to lose a loved one twice. So uh, in line with our, our work with victims, we'd like to honour them tonight. Now, turning to our lecture on a day when the UK and the EU, um, of which Ireland still remains a member, is moving further apart, we need to make friends in Britain, who in turn will be friends of the relationship between Britain and Ireland. The greatest progress over these past 50 years, such as the new analysis born out of the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985, the creation of the Downing Street Declaration leading to the ceasefires, and ultimately the Good Friday Belfast Agreement of 1998, were all achieved and only achieved through intergovernmental cooperation between London and Dublin. It was the arc of electricity that flowed between the two capitals that powered the peace process and gave us the possibility to imagine new relationships across the islands of Britain, Ireland and Northern Ireland. There is no escaping that despite, uh, sorry, it's no escaping that despite what may emerge in the future, we have inherited this complex and contested history across these islands. Brexit and indeed recent events in Ukraine teaches us that there is little in the way of permanence in anything, 
and yet proximity of places and people will never change. The challenge, therefore, is to imagine and realise the possibility that conflict must, ne must never again be the mechanism to resolve issues that divide us, and that partnership is better than partisanship in divided spaces. With that said, I would now like to invite Lord Gavin Barwell to deliver the keynote lecture. While Gavin is making his way to the stage, I'll just read a little bit about, about your, your bio, Gavin, if that's all right. Gavin is a member of the House of Lords and served as Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister Theresa May from June 2017 to July 2019, during one of the most turbulent periods in British political history. As the Prime Minister's senior political advisor, he was intimately involved in the conduct of the Brexit negotiations and the development of key domestic policies. A Member of Parliament from 2010 to 2017, Gavin was a former Whip and Minister of State for Housing and Planning and, Mi and Minister for London. Prior to his election to Parliament, he was COO of the Conservative Party and served as a local councillor in his hometown of Croydon. In 2019, he was appointed to the House of Lords. Taken together, these roles have given him an unparalleled insight into British polit politics from grassroots campaigning in a marginal seat through party headquarters, local government, parliament, ministerial office to 10 Downing Street, as well as a good network at a number of European governments and EU institutions. Gavin now runs his own business, providing advice to clients, including Arcadis, Avonhurst, Barrett, Blackstone, Community Fibre, DLA Piper and PwC on public policy and geopolitical trends. He is a non-executive director of Clarion Housing Group, a member of the advisory board of the leading think tank Work Foundation and vice president of London Councils. Please join me in welcoming Gavin to the stage. Well, thank you very much for that kind uh, invitation. I'm honoured uh, to be your guest speaker tonight. I'm also slightly nervous. I wasn't much of a diplomat. Uh, when I was in number 10 uh, working for the Prime Minister. And I'm conscious that this is a subject that you've asked me to speak about, which, which is a highly emotional one for many people. I'm also, I'm sad to say, um, ashamed to be giving this speech uh, on the day that the British government has announced that it's going to introduce legislation uh, which will potentially override the solemn undertakings it gave to respect the unique circumstances on this island as part of its... Uh, withdrawal from the European Union. I wanted to start by saying some general words about the role of identity in modern politics and then specifically address, address identities across our islands and how they've been impacted by the UK's decision to leave the EU. Um, I recently turned uh, 50, which is something I'm still struggling to come to terms with. When I first took an interest in politics as a, as a nerdy teenager in the mid-1980s. It was basically about economics and about security. Uh, not just in the UK, I think, but across much of the, the democratic world, there was an argument between a market economy and, and socialism in terms of economic policy. And obviously, we were at the height of the Cold War, and, and the issues about international politics and security were also preeminent. And it, in the period in which I've been actively involved in politics, there's been a realignment that has taken place. And again, I would say not just in the UK, but across uh, many uh, democratic systems. And today, I would argue that in, in much of the democratic world, politics is now about cultural issues uh, and about identity much more than it's about economics. If you think about that in a UK context, when I was growing up, if you were trying to work out which party might hold the MP for a particular constituency, the percentage of working class people living in that constituency would be a pretty good indication. If it was a strongly working class area, it would probably have a Labour MP. And if it was a more middle class area, it would probably have a Conservative MP. Today, in UK politics, and also you see the same in the US, class has zero predictive ability in terms of which party is likely to represent an area. It's about people's age, it's about whether they live in a city or whether they live in the countryside or a suburb. It's about whether they've got a university education uh, or not. And this, this identity politics has variants on both the left and the right. You see it in the kind of the populist nationalism that we see in a number of countries around the world, populist leaders having taken power, and you see it in the kind of identity politics uh, of the left as well. And it has made politics, I think, much harder. If you and I disagree about what percentage of the state's 
uh, of the national income the state should consume in taxes and spend on public services, and you think it should be 35%, and I think it should be 40%, we can probably both live with a country where it's 37 and a half. But where politics is about questions of identity, it's much harder to find common ground that we can all uh, either agree with or at least uh, live with. And I think for people like myself, and I would, you know, I would regard myself as, as sort of on the centre right of politics, but certainly in the centre ground, this question of identity is, is quite a difficult one. It's a fundamental part of our human condition, our human nature. It, I think if you, if you talk to evolutionary scientists, they will say that our ability to identify with things that don't exist in the physical world, whether that be states or religions or whatever, it's what has allowed us as a species to cooperate in very large numbers. Um, so identity is, is something fundamental to us. But taken to excess, it can also be dangerous. If I think about the politics of my own country and what I've seen over the last 20 or 30 years, you know, whether it's people who are saying, you know, migrants are to blame for the economic problems you've got, you've got you're experiencing because they've come to this country and they've taken our jobs or whether it's nationalism in Scotland arguing that all of Scotland's problems would be solved if only it separated itself from England and Wales, or whether it's Brexiteers saying that all of the problems in British public life could be solved by removing the UK from the European Union. These, these emotive questions of identity can be very powerful. And one of the things that I wanted to argue to you tonight very strongly is that identity isn't simple. It isn't binary. If I, try and, if I try and think about myself and how I view myself, partly because politically I react against some of the kind of English nationalism that I see in my country at the moment, I think of myself as more British than English, although I'm obviously technically both. And more than either, I think of myself as a Londoner and identify with the, with the city that I am from. Uh, paradoxically, despite being a Londoner, I'm a huge fan of Liverpool Football Club, and that's a big part of my uh, identity, something I inherited from my, from my late father. And I think of myself as a conservative, although sadly a slightly homeless one uh, at the moment in the current context of British politics. So my identity is complicated. It's got a lot of things mixed up in it. When I was growing up, a, a prominent conservative politician, Norman Tebbit, formulated a test by which he said we could judge whether people who had come to the UK whether their loyalty lay with the UK or their, uh, their, the country that they, had, they or their families had originally come from. And it was this cricket test. It was if you, were, uh, if you were from India and you'd migrated to the UK or you were from the Caribbean and you'd migrated to the UK, who did you support in the cricket? And it's a completely false test. My, my best friend is British Indian. He was born in the UK but of Indian parents. And I think what, something he said to me about this illustrates my point very powerfully. So he definitely thinks of himself as British but not English because he sees English as a sort of ethnic identity whereas he sees British as a, as a sort of national umbrella that everybody can ascribe to. And when it comes to sport, he would support England against India in any sport other than cricket where he would support India. And I think it's a good story because it illustrates the complexity of identity. And I also want to recall for you, when I was Chief of Staff, there was an occasion when... I and, a, and one member of the cabinet had a private dinner with, with Jeffrey Donaldson and Nigel Dodds. And it was, a, it was a good occasion because it was one of those things where you could get past the kind of formulaic positions people take in politics and just talk a little bit as human beings. And Jeffrey Donaldson said something that night that really struck me and has stayed with me. And I think when I come to the end of what I have to say is, is one of the sort of hopes I have for the future. He was almost talking to himself, but he was musing that he was Irish as well as British, and that maybe he spent too much time emphasising the Britishness and not enough time talking about the Irishness. Uh, and so I think that's a, a powerful thing, that, that the choices are not necessarily binary. It's possible to feel Irish and not at all British, British and not Irish, or to feel um, both at the same time. So turning to Brexit which is obviously the elephant in the room, I think it's very easy uh, to see Brexit as the cause of this sort of identity 
politics and the change we've seen. Because in terms of the, the challenges that we have at the moment in Anglo-Irish relations, it certainly was the, the moment that things became much more um, difficult. But I would actually argue to all of you that Brexit is a symptom of that realignment that has been going on in politics and the growing kind of identity politics rather than the proximate cause of it. Um, so certainly it's then made issues more difficult subsequently. Um, but I don't think uh, it was a sort of event that had no, no build-up to it, essentially, no, no warning that it was coming. It has obviously uh, upset the delicate progress that we have made on these islands. And I thought, Barbara, you're, you, were, you were very generous in your introduction in the way that you described it. The relationship is fractious at the moment, but it is also extraordinarily important. And I think that both of our countries should regard the progress we made in the Good Friday Agreement and the subsequent agreements as one of our greatest achievements um, of the, of the post-war period. And I find it very upsetting to see that progress uh, now in jeopardy. And it's not just important to us. I think you are absolutely right to say that what we achieved um, is an example to others around the world who are struggling with intractable conflict at the moment. I suppose the main thing that I want to say to you tonight is I think that that uh, damage that has been done is the result of three things. Carelessness on some people's part, miscalculation on some people's part, and reckless indifference, I'm afraid to say, on some people's part. And I want to unpack that a bit and explore it uh, with you. I think the mistakes have mainly been on the UK side, but not solely. And I think the, the EU also needs to reflect on how it has handled the six years uh, since the democratic decision that the British people um, took. So how did we get here? The starting point, I think, is to acknowledge that there have always been some people in UK politics who are uncomfortable with the UK's membership of what was originally uh, the EC, then the European Community, then the European Union. And they took the position they did for very uh, pure sovereignty reasons. Uh, they took what I would regard as a very narrow view of sovereignty, saying that all of the decisions that affect people in a country should be taken by the elected parliament of that country and to, to transfer some responsibilities to some kind of supranational body is, is to give away sovereignty and is fundamentally undemocratic. Now, I would take a more pragmatic view which is that actually on some issues when we pool sovereignty together as countries, we can achieve a lot more than we can if each country just holds on to its own sovereignty. But I, I certainly accept the principle of their argument. I understand the case that they make. I think that the, one of the key turning points was the emergence of UKIP as a serious political force in the UK. And, and its emergence combined with our first past the post electoral system that we had. And I am one of the guilty parties here. I think a number of Conservative MPs in marginal seats saw that unless we could defeat this challenge from UKIP, the risk was actually we would lose an election uh, and you would get a sort of Labour Lib Dem coalition in. So we allied ourselves with those people who wanted to leave the European Union and were campaigning for a referendum for that purpose. We decided that actually tactically to have a referendum would be the way to deal with the threat of UKIP and we were confident that we would win that referendum. Uh, and that was clearly you know, a significant misjudgment. For what it's worth, I think it was, it's one of those misjudgments in history that you can understand to a degree. I think David Cameron, when he made the pledge, made two assumptions. The first was that when the referendum came, the Labour Party would be led by somebody who was unambiguously pro-EU, and the full weight of the Labour Party would be behind him in the referendum. And for what it's worth, I think everybody else would have shared that assumption. Jeremy Corbyn's election was not something that anybody predicted. The second assumption, which I think is maybe more questionable, is that he thought that the Leave campaign wouldn't have any significant popular figure leading it. In other words, he believed Boris Johnson would be on his side in that referendum, and that misjudgment was clearly crucial. The second uh, mistake, and this I think is where the carelessness comes in, and I am as guilty of it as many others, is that when we had the campaign in the UK, when the referendum took place, there was virtually no reference to the consequences of the decision for Northern Ireland. And that is something that 
everybody involved has to put their hands up and apologize for. Um, I think it was unconscionable that more thought wasn't being given to the specific implications for this island of the decision that we were uh, taking as a country. But it's after the result of the referendum uh, that I think things become even harder to defend. The main case that I want to make to you tonight is that a significant chunk of people in UK politics have never faced up to the reality of the consequences of the decision that we took as a country. If the UK leaves the EU, the logical consequence of that is for there to be a border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. There are really only two ways of avoiding that logical uh, consequence. One is what people have termed a soft Brexit, either where the UK stays in the customs union in the single market or something of the kind that Theresa tried to pursue, which seeks to avoid the need for a new border anywhere, or the border goes where the current withdrawal agreement places it, um, down the Irish Sea. And you know, I heard today Geoffrey Donaldson in the House of Commons saying we want the Irish Sea border removed. Well, if you want that border removed, there are only two other alternatives. You either have a soft Brexit with all the consequences of that, and that's not something the Johnson government is going to entertain, or you are talking about some kind of border on this island. And sooner or later, politicians are going to have to face up to that reality. And I just wanted to deal with two arguments that I suspect virtually nobody in this room would have any time for, but were repeated to me ad nauseam in the two years that I worked with Theresa to try and resolve this issue. The first was that the Good Friday Agreement didn't make any mention of regulatory checks and customs checks. Well, no, of course it didn't, because at the time that it was agreed, nobody, assumed, nobody gave any thought to the idea that either Ireland or the UK might leave uh, the single market or the customs union. But what, what a border uh, on this island, or indeed I would argue the border that we now have um, down the Irish Sea does, I think is to challenge the spirit of that agreement. Because like any agreement that brings to the end, an end a difficult, long conflict, the genius of it was it allowed both sides to feel to a degree that they had won. And you will never get a resolution to a conflict that doesn't allow both sides to feel they have walked away with something. Um, and to me, you know, stripping aside the legal text, at its heart, what the agreement did was, from a unionist point of view, Ireland and nationalists recognised the status quo and that it wouldn't change unless there was democratic, democratic consent for that change. But the UK agreed to dismantle all of the security infrastructure at the border so that in day-to-day -day life, it doesn't feel like there's a border there. And also recognised that Northern Ireland is not integral to the UK in the way that other parts are, that it has a different status and that if there is popular demand for constitutional change, then that will happen. And so, you know, any measure that is introducing checks when goods move on this island is clearly contrary to the spirit of that agreement, whether or not uh, it's covered by the letter of it. And I had similar arguments made to me that, well, look, we can have the checks but have them away from the border. And to me, that completely misunderstood the point. Um, I remember having a conversation uh, with Nigel Dodds once saying, well, look, if we had checks across the Irish Sea but they didn't actually happen at the port, they happened away from the border, would that be acceptable to you? And he said, no. Well, I said, well, why do you think doing the same north-south is going to be acceptable to nationalists? So there's been a consistent failure, I think, to face up to uh, the real choices. And I would argue to you that you, if, you, if you took the whole population of the UK, the very last people who should have advocated Brexit were unionists in Northern Ireland, completely contrary to their own long-term interests. But as I said at the outset, I don't, think, uh, I don't think the EU can escape some criticism for the way it handled the issue uh, either. I believed at the time when I was working for Theresa, and I continue to believe, that any solution to the Brexit conundrum that tries to create a new border, north, south, or east, west, is going to run into significant opposition. And therefore, I think that the EU should, on reflection, have offered Theresa a little bit more in what she was trying to do. I think the kernel of her solution, trying to find a mechanism that avoided a border, but which clearly left the UK 
worse off than if it had stayed in the single market and the customs union and the EU had to be the right solution to this problem. But if that's, um, if that's where we got to, as it were, until recently, things have become much more difficult uh, after the change of government. The sad truth, I'm afraid, is that Boris Johnson prioritised getting Brexit done, getting the UK out of the EU, over the implications uh, for this island, and that he signed up to a deal that I believe he never fully intended to implement in order to be in a position to go to an election and claim he'd got an oven ready deal and Brexit was all going to be done. And we are living now with the consequences of those uh, two decisions. Liz Truss in the House Commons today said that the Good Friday Agreement is under strain. This is because the protocol does not have the support necessary in one part of the community. I think it's difficult to argue with that factual statement, but my response to it would be what the government is doing in response doesn't enjoy the support necessary in one part of the community. The problem is we've got ourselves into a situation where it's difficult to see any way forward that is going to enjoy cross-community consent. And we now have two problems. We have a UK government, as I said, that is not facing up to the logical consequences of the decision of the kind of Brexit that it wants, and which has undermined trust in it, which is critical in any negotiation. But we also have uh, the DUP having withdrawn um, from strands of the Good Friday Agreement and now from devolved government. And it, to me, that is one of the most ironic things at all. I, can, I, I can't begin to count the number of conversations I had between 2017 and 2019 where various DUP spokesmen came in and complained bitterly about Sinn Féin having withdrawn from the executive and the dire consequences it was having for Northern Ireland not having a functioning government. And actually, I, I totally understood their concern about a lack of government. They are now at risk of perpetrating exactly the same problem. So I wanted to end with some thoughts on the way forward, and I'm afraid I don't have... Any, any easy answers uh, to the challenges. I think that the starting point has to be to recognise that whatever one thinks about the way the DUP has handled the issue, the concerns unionist voters have about the protocol are genuine. The difficulty, I think, is that you have a British government and a DUP that seems unwilling to accept any of the alternative solutions. And the EU is now, I think, in a difficult trap, and, and Ireland as a member of the EU partly caught in this, which is it will not want to reward the way the British government is behaving with further concessions. But I think it is also important to address, and I would distinguish, if you, li if you listen to what Liz Truss had to say in the House of Commons today, I would distinguish between some of the pr pragmatic concerns about volumes of paperwork and checks versus some of the concerns that I think I don't hear at all from the business community in Northern Ireland about the role of the CJU and some of those other kind of political constitutional questions. And the final thought I want to leave you with, and I think um, your organisation is a great exemplar of this, is that really the only way through this is going to be to continue talking. The relationships and the progress that we've made are too important, and we are ultimately going to have to find uh, some way through. My own view is that it's unlikely the UK is ever going to rejoin the EU. Possible, but unlikely. But I am very confident that at some point a future UK government will seek a more sensible relationship than the one that we have in this deal. And I will end with the thought uh, that what is happening right now in Ukraine is an example to all of us that whatever the differences in our identities the challenges and the problems that we confront have a lot in common and demand working together on cooperation and dialogue. So thank you for the opportunity uh, to be with you today and I look forward to joining the panel.